Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Today for Fish and Wildlife Management, I'm going to try to bridge the gap between Charles Darwin and Aldo Leopold. Okay. And hopefully by the end of the next couple of lectures, you'll understand where I'm coming from, where I like to take fish and wildlife and how I like to connect Charles Darwin and Aldo Leopold in the creation or the development of fish and wildlife management. So just like Darwin, I want to talk about Aldo Leopold and his early years and kind of the influence that he had from his experiences early on in life. So let's dive in. So first of all, um, Aldo Leopold was born January 11th, 1887 in Burlington, Iowa. Okay, so um, famous for the railroad, and you'll see why that plays a very important role in Aldo's life. Okay, his father was Carl Leopold, and his mother was Clara Starker. Now, Carl Leopold and Clara Starker were cousins. Clara was Carl's first cousin. And so, again, like I said before when we were talking about Charles Darwin and Darwin's history of um, ancestral relationships um, and all the all the Leopold's uh, parents were cousins, okay? It's not that this connection means, hey, you know, cousins should get together. It makes uh, brilliant individuals. Um, it, it's a sign of the times, okay? This was early on before the 1900s, and even into the 1900s, cousins still um, married and, and whatnot. But in the 1800s, it was very, very common for that to occur. So again, like I said, they were first cousins. Um, Aldo was the oldest of four. Okay, so Mary, Carl, and Frederick. Um, and uh, you'll see as we keep talking that um, Aldo's parents really drove a lot of um, characteristics or traits that we see in Aldo. They also provided these traits in, in his uh, siblings, and um, you'll see that carrying it on, Aldo carried it on to his children, and also um, uh, all those uh, brothers and sisters, or brother and sister, brothers and sister, um, also carried it on to their, their children, okay? And, and you'll see the name Leopold is... Uh, you know, very famous, and um, especially in scientific communities, and, and there's a lot of information out there on the Leopolds and how that works. Um, <clears throat> so when we look at Carl Leopold or Aldo's father, we have to talk about kind of what his role in all those life was and that was Carl was a teacher Carl his his job was actually to be a, a traveling salesman but he taught his children a lot of things he taught his children about nature he taught his children about hunting and fishing he taught his children about how to use the land and not abuse the land and you'll see that Carl as he was growing as an individual. Aldo's dad, as he was growing as an individual, his attitude towards the environment, his attitude, attitude towards his current position and his job changed. Okay, just like Aldo's, as we progress and talk more about Aldo Leopold. Okay, so Carl Le Leopold, Aldo's father, was a tra traveling salesman. Okay. Um, and he learned a lot from his father-in-law, 
That is darker in, in that um, he found out how to kind of uh, keep books or bookkeeping. So not only was he a salesman, he was also um, kind of an accountant. Um, and so he was a very valuable resource to his business partners. Okay. So they mainly sold barbed wire and roller skates. Um, and it wasn't the roller skates, obviously, that was changing the landscape, but it was the barbed wire. And Carl Leopold learned early on that barbed wire, yes, it was paying his bills, but it was also changing the landscape, the ecosystem. And he, he was soon figuring out that his job of selling barbed wire to people was destroying the American West and even um, parts of Central uh, United States. Right. Apart from that, his hunting practices and other things had had to change. So he he's quoted saying this last last evening, three of us were out from four o'clock till eight and brought home 60 young birds and mules or jackrabbits. And so he soon found out that by taking so many wildlife, so many birds or so many rabbits, that uh, he was decimating populations, changing the ecosystem, and um, eventually he came to come up with an idea or uh, what we call the sports, sportsman's etiquette that he passed on to his children. So Carl was unaware at first, uh, you know, to what his career um, was doing to destroying wild games and wild places. Um, he didn't tie the barbed wire quite um, yet. So when he was young, uh, he was unaware of that. Okay. Now, Clara Starker, or Aldo's mother, was the opposite of Carl uh, Leopold, in that Clara was kind of, I don't want to say uh, higher scale or um, more sophisticated, but she was a little bit more sophisticated than her husband. And Clara had been raised to go to the opera and raised to be um, very ladylike. And so um, she liked the opera and things like that and wasn't keen on wild places and wild things. When And Carl was, you know, he liked to hunt and fish and etc. So Aldo got kind of the both, both aspects. He got kind of high society and the hunting and fishing um, from from his parents. Okay, his parents were married in 1886. Okay? And like I said before, not unusual during this during this time for first cousins to be married. And there was no objections um, to the marriage of the two. Okay? Clara wanted Carl to stay in Burlington. And, and the reason for that is a lot of things that Clara liked, uh, the society, the, the shops, the clothing, you know, kind of the upscaleness was in Burlington because of the railroad. And so, so uh, Carl decided, okay, we're going to stay here. We're going to set roots. And, uh, he started an office furniture business with Rand and, and Starker. Okay. Now, the one thing that I want to make sure that you understand is the upbringing of all the Leopold was a little bit different than, say, Charles Darwin, where Charles Darwin had to go against his father's wishes. Remember, his mother died really young. But it, he had to go against his father's wishes. His, his father wanted him to be a physician. That didn't work out. Then he wanted to be him, him to be a clergyman or a man of the church. OK, 
Okay, that didn't work out. So Charles Darwin kind of went against the grain. Um, Aldo Leopold, he didn't really have his parents pushing him in a certain direction. His parents educated him in a different way. Um, so his parents allowed him to experience the outdoors and fishing and hunting and that kind of stuff and the opera and, and you know, high society and things like that. And they were just allowing him to experience it all and make his own conclusions. And that's that's kind of important um, because the aspects of Leopold as he progresses in life were very different. Um, you can see both parts of his parents in, in his later life. <clears throat> So when uh, we talk about Darwin, remember I said that Charles Darwin would often skip school, would often um, avoid going to class so he could collect beetles and things like that. Aldo was, was different. Um, he he kind of did no wrong. Um, even skipping school, the occasional time that he skipped school, he apologized profusely to the instructor, to the teacher. Um, he loved to go to school. He loved education. He loved um, learning. And um, and you can tell by some of his early writings that, uh, that he was going to be a scientist early on. So he was an avid reader. He got a lot of poetry from his mother, and then he he got other books from his father that were like, you know, Henry David Thoreau. So things um, that were about nature, wild places, um, still a little poetic, um, but about you know, throw, Thoreau wrote about. Um, humans destroying landscapes. So Thoreau was an Eastern writer um, and he wrote about deforestation there and things like that. And then of course, Jack London, most of you know, Call of the Wild. <clears throat> so at the age of 11, Aldo was into studying birds. Um, so he, you know, fairly young in life, he had already kind of set himself on being a birder. And not only that, he set himself on collecting data. And um, so again, not, not being pushed by his parents in one way or another, he just enjoyed uh, monitoring bird nests and things like that. So he um, did so on his own. And actually he would borrow his mother's opera glasses um, because binoculars, I don't want to say they weren't a thing, but opera glasses were basically binocular glass, uh, binoculars or kind of a low end binocular. And so he would take his mother's opera glasses and he would use those as binoculars um, while monitoring bird nests. Okay. <clears throat> and at the age of 13, because of his love for birds, you know, his parents bought him a book, uh, The Handbook of Birds of Eastern North America. And there's a picture of that by Chapman. In the 1880s and 1890s, there was a lot going on in the United States. Um, and it, it was it was a perfect time for a young man like Aldo Leopold to to come and be raised um, from the late 1800s into the 1900s and to move from being a young man who enjoyed the outdoors into an individual who could manage the outdoors. And um, it was a perfect time because in the 1880s and 90s, there was no limit on how many waterfall or anything like that you could, could be taken. So you would see train cars like this that are just loaded with snow geese and Canada geese and ducks and swans, all kinds of things just draped off of them that were going to market because people were market hunting and selling 
waterfowl to different buyers and to different restaurants, etc. So the limitations were were not put in place. And actually, in fact, not only were there no limits on how many waterfowl waterfowl you could take, there was also no limits on when you could take them. So you could shoot them off their nests during the nesting season. Um, you could shoot them at night. You, you could do whatever you want. There was really no limits whatsoever. You could spotlight them. You can do all kinds of things. And so, you know, this period of time in the United States were, especially in the Burlington region of the United States, all the Leopold got to see truck loads and boat loads and wagon loads and train loads of wild game that was going off to sale. And um, he, he experienced this, and so did his father. And his father would often talk to um, Aldo and say, hey, you know, this is not a good thing. This is ruining hunting grounds and fishing grounds, etc., cetera, um, in the central part of the United States. So Carl Leopold was one of those individuals early on that decided, hey, something needs to change. Uh, you know, there's too many wild animals being taken off the landscape and we need to have a, a hunter's etiquette or a hunting technique to allow for uh, organisms to persist into the future. And so Carl started what he would call the code of sportsmanship. Okay. And he taught this to his son. And you'll see that a lot of all those uh, kind of writings and things like that really come from Carl Leopold's code of sportsmanship. And so, again, Carl Leopold was not a biologist. He was a businessman. He was a furniture salesman. But he was an avid hunter and fisherman. And he realized early on that there was a problem. And so he taught his son this. Never load a gun until sunrise. Okay? Even though it was perfectly legal to shirt, shoot birds or wild animals way before sunrise. Okay? You could shoot them at night, anytime. He always said, never load a gun until sunrise. Always use a double barrel gun. Okay? No pump actions. Okay, You, know, you never can use um, more ammo, you shouldn't have a distinct advantage over the game that you're going after. So basically, you got two shots and you better make them count. Okay. Pursue all crippled birds. If you shoot it, it falls, it's not dead. Okay. You stop hunting until you find that bird and put that bird out of its misery and take that game um, as one of your one of your organisms okay? or one of your bag limits. Never use an automatic or a pump. Okay? That goes back to kind of that double-barreled gun. Okay? Never use automatic guns or pump guns. Never hunt after sundown. Okay? And then he set his own bag limits. Okay? If he noticed that there was fewer canvasback ducks, then he would only take one okay? or sometimes none. If he didn't see any canvasbacks, and then all of a sudden he saw one canvasback, he would he wouldn't shoot it. Okay, and so he set his own bag limits, and not just with bird hunting, but also with fishing. And he'd set his own krill limits with fishing. Um, he had a code that he wanted not only himself to follow, but he also wanted his friends to follow. He'd provide his friends with the, his sportsmanship code. He also wanted his son to follow, his sons to follow, and so he, you know, really had a lot of what we would consider limits or limitations to hunting laid out in this sportsmanship code when it wasn't needed at the time. There was there was no limits, there was no regulations, no spring hunting. Right? You had to allow the organisms time to uh, reproduce, and um, Carl really realized this early on. You are not to sell any of your game. Uh, 
you're not to sell the meat, the feathers, nothing like that. Um, that's not sportsmanship or that's not sportsmanlike. Okay, now I it's kind of a caveat here that he, just like his mother, um, or all the Leopold's father, just like his mother, never pushed anything on their children. They'd always say, you were to figure things out yourself, but here are my rules. Here's what I abide by. And his mother would say, you know, here's what I like. Here's the poetry I like to read. Here's the, you know, operas I like to go to. Make your own decisions. Okay? So again, his boys were never, Carl's boys were never bound to any of these rules. They were supposed to learn it by themselves. But Aldo really took to hunting fairly young, and he would always hunt with his father. So he grew up with these rules, and he would abide by his father's rules. Okay. And he did learn the hard way. Okay. His very first hunting trip, he writes that he shot up all of his shotgun shells and took two quail um, and, you know, was a, a really poor shot because he didn't take the time to, you know, set up a shot or take the time to um, realize what he was doing. He was, you know, he was trigger happy. And, um, and you'll see that later on he talks about that. Um, okay, eventually he became an excellent shot. And... Um, he, he credits his father as being a very good naturalist. Now, that term naturalist comes back. Remember that when, you know, we were talking about Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin was a naturalist. Um, that was just a term for an individual that was ecologically minded, um, an individual who was basically a self-proclaimed ecologist, okay? And so even though Carl, he lacked any scientific training, he was really going to be um, an avid promoter of wild places and an avid promoter of doing the right thing. So again, like I said before, even though he didn't push these things on his children, when they go on family outings, when they go camping and things like that, he would tell his, his kids, hey, there's no reason to cut down all those trees or there's no reason to clear out all the bushes. Um, you know, there's no reason to collect all the dead wood and shoot all the birds and catch all the fish. Only take what you need for the given time period that you're going to be there. Okay. And so um, he he did provide lectures, I guess, or information to his children about the trees and the bushes and the birds and, and swamp things. And really, he knew a lot about the, the different organisms. He knew where they like to nest. And, and a lot of that stuff came from being an avid reader and spending a lot of time in nature. <clears throat> So again, um, Aldo Leopold was very bright. Um, that probably a lot of that intelligence came um, because his father was an avid reader, his mother was an avid reader, and that made all Aldo Leopold an avid reader, and he read a lot. Um, but he was also very shy. And um, he kind of kept to himself. And so a lot of that tendency to be shy, keep to yourself, and um, especially when it came to girls, he was not actively trying to court anyone um, in his later years, uh, in, like in high school and things like that. Um, he wasn't, it, it didn't seem like he was very interested in girls. He was interested in education. Uh, and so I guess you could say he was not antisocial, but he was also non-social. Um, 
which I think you can probably say for a lot of individuals that were considered naturalists, they wanted to be in nature. And so, yes, they would have conversations with people, okay? but their goal wasn't to always be around people. Their goal was to be around natural places, wild things. And so I think that's where all those kind of mannerism came into, about, into play. Um, so it was said by Frederick that uh, Aldo didn't think he was cut from the same cloth, and he wasn't. Um, so where a lot of, where Aldo's brothers and his sister were much more sociable, um, and they learned that from their mother going to operas and things like that, Aldo was geared for a different kind of I guess you could say a different kind of path. Okay, all the loot used to collect um, quotations that impressed him, and one that um, he got from Emerson okay, uh, was that, you know, this quote here finish every day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and some absurdities, no doubt, have crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Now, not only was certain individuals, certain writings and certain quotations um, important for all the Leopold, but you'll see if you've ever read Sand County Almanac, he's very poetic um, in his writing. And that probably comes from his background with reading a lot of poetry. He read a lot of poetry. He read a lot of writers like Thoreau and Emerson and would write um, poetically, and he does so in Sand County Al Almanac. <clears throat> okay, so as a young man, he developed a interest for the field of forestry. Okay. There's only a single college in the nation that taught forestry classes, and that was Yale. Okay. And so to better prepare for entrance into Yale, because um, it was hard to get into, there's only one, one college in the entire nation that taught forestry classes and all the Leopold wanted to go um, to be a forester. Okay, and So he entered kind of a, a prep school to get him into Yale, Lawrenceville um, School. And uh, that really allowed him to kind of gear himself for college. So at 17, he kind of moved away from public and moved into kind of a private school that was kind of geared towards college and um, started there. Okay. In 1905, he started um, in Yale or at Yale um, in Sheffield Scientific School. And so there's all the Leopold um, right there. Class of 1908 is um, 1908, 1909 is when he finished. Okay, so roughly four years, three and a half years in his forestry school. And uh, all the Leopold was, you know, an excellent student during uh, his time there and landed a job in New Mexico and parts of Arizona in what we call the Forest Service, or at, at the time, what we called the Forest Service District 3. Now, I have to preface this with a little bit. In 1909, um, these were territories. Arizona and New Mexico were territories, okay? So they weren't even states yet, um, but the Forest Service did have a district um, that runs kind of the uh, what you would call the forest land that goes from northern Arizona um, through kind of the eastern part of Arizona into the western part of New Mexico. Um, that's all tall pine forest, um, ponderosa pine, typically um, in that region, some lodgepole pine also. And so that kind of 
district, that fourth district is district number three, or was at the time. Now it's, you know, depending on the state, um, and it's broken up into a lot more districts than that. Okay, and then um, in, in 1911, after two years in District 3, he moved to the Carson National Forest in northern New Mexico. Now, Leopold was a what you could consider a very quick study. Um, he was an excellent forest service employee, but on top of that, he wanted to learn from the land. So Leopold was not just about, hey, what did Yale teach me about managing forests? He has also wanted to know, well, what can the sheep ranchers or or the cattle ranchers in the region teach me about the habitat and about the role of fire in this region? What, you know, what is the problem with predators and and in this region and how how do i manage that because remember there's in in the early 1900s there was no game management there was no fish and wildlife management so the forest service they dealt with complaints about wolves and complaints about you know disease and things like that complaints about you know lack of water and, and things like that and that's the Forest Service would deal with those complaints, along with fire and and you know the need to trim trees and clear out regions if someone was going to log that region. You know the Forest Service would kind of give them permission or revoke their permission to do so. <clears throat> okay, so it was quoted that. Aldo is a well qualified now for a deputy supervisor in almost any forest district. He is thoroughly interested in all phases of the forest work, more so, in fact, than almost any forest assistant that I have met for a long time. Okay, so his supervisors were writing about Aldo and his work as, you know, a forest manager uh, and, and suggested, hey, it's time for this young man to move up the ranks. And he moved up the ranks very quickly um, and kind of be, you know, the head of a forest district. Okay. In 1911, he met his wife, Estella, um, and uh, he wrote, you know, different things about Estella. Basically, she was great on a horse. Um, that's because her family were ranchers, um, sheep ranchers. And uh, and so she she kind of grew up riding horses quite a bit. And he was obviously took to her. Um, and eventually made her his wife. But at the time, she was being courted by another individual. And, you know, he had reluctancy to do this um, because he thought that he was behaving in, a, in a, a bad way. Eventually, everything worked out. Um, and, uh, you know, Aldo started courting her. Um, A lot of all those early years uh, was learning periods, um, learning periods when it came to managing forests, learning periods when it came to courting a woman because it was really kind of his first opportunity um, to court um, a lady. And so he would write about things that you know he was trying to please um you know his friends he, he was hoping his friends would be proud of him he was hoping that estella would be proud of him um and then it was also a lonely time for aldo because he was not in the same region as estella and so he was managing a forest a long ways away and um, and he didn't get to see her very much, so he'd write lots of letters that basically said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm continuing on my life because of you, you know, things like that, so. Okay, and he worked for 15 years in New Mexico, and during his time in New Mexico, he 
not only managed the forest well and worked his way up into the forest manager head position of uh, um, of the district. Okay? He also wrote a comprehensive management plan for the Grand Canyon. Okay? He wrote the very first Game and Fish Handbook. So again, like I said before, management, it, yes, it was called forest management or the forest service, but the forest service at the time, they were head of every management. They were head of the grasslands, they were head of the forest, they were head of the rivers, the, the fish, the game. Um, so, you know, he really took to that and, and kind of involved it all, more so than really anyone had to this point. Okay. And at the time, all the Leopold realized that there was need for wild places. There was need for areas that organisms could escape to, that humans could escape to, that couldn't be reached by motorized vehicles and couldn't be reached by technology and things like that. So when he was working in New Mexico, he proposed the Gila Wilderness Area, and eventually it became the first national wilderness area much later. But he had proposed it while he was there, and really, the all the all the Leopold's role in fish and wildlife management is huge because he started wilderness areas. So every wilderness area that we know of really started with Aldo Leopold's first proposal for the Gila Wilderness Area, and it became the first national wilderness area. So all the wilderness areas out there, all those refuges that elk and deer and, you know, bear and wolves, all those refuge, refuges that those animals can escape to during you know, hunting seasons or outside of hunting seasons, they can escape the weather in these regions. Um, we owe that to all the Leopold um, because he recognized it early on that game animals don't stay in one place. They have to be able to migrate and you have to provide areas set aside for those migrations. And so that's why he proposed the Gila Wilderness Area. And so all the Leopold, you can see here, young man amongst old individuals, um, he, he moved up the ranks very quickly uh, in, in the Forest Service. He enjoyed his time in the Forest Service, uh, yet he was always seeking more challenges. Okay. And so in 1924, he transferred to the U.S. Forest Products in Madison, Wisconsin. And this really allowed him to be with his wife and his family and to really set up roots and, and start a family in a given region. Um, he was no longer going to be on horseback every day, um, you know, trampling through the forests and, and managing that way. He was moving into the Forest Products Laboratory. This also allowed him to make bigger decisions like what forests should be set aside, where should other wilderness areas occur, what land and how often should we cut the material and these kind of um, ideas. And so he, he really wanted to be a manager and a manager of great regions, not just one little forest, but a manager of like the entire western United States and even parts of central um, United States. And so that's where we're going to pause or stop for today um, for this lecture. That's kind of his early life. And after his time as a forest service, in the forest service, and then a little bit in um, the forest products laboratory in Madison, he became interested in wildlife management and not not that he wanted to get away from trees and, and vegetation, but he was interested in wildlife management a lot more. And so that piece, I, 
I kind of broke off, and that's his later life, um, and we'll talk about that next time.